Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh One, and you are watching One Mind Syndicate. Today, we continue with the 13th Black Crusade as we get into part two. So let's get into 40 Facts About the 13th Black Crusade. The world of Circea had also suffered at the hands of the enemy during the 13th Black Crusade. A delegation from the Order of the Wounded Heart, an ordo militant of the Adeptus Sororitis, had arrived on the world. Immediately after the Battle Sister's arrival, it was reported that a small force of unidentified traitor marines had been defeated when they came to the aid of a Chaos cult that the Sisters were engaged upon purging. It appears the cult had chosen their moment to call upon the traitors with great care, hoping that the counterattack would wipe out the small force of Battle Sisters. Credit goes to the Sororitas for defeating both the cultists and the renegades, and a commendation was passed on to their canonist superior. The listening station at Ormontel had also come under attack by traitor forces. The attackers were a small elite company of black legionnaires, who fell upon the listening post with cold, methodic brutality, and cut down all they encountered. They seemed specifically determined to murder the astropathic choir that resided within the central keep. The unit of Cadian Kazarkin defending the station mounted a heroic defense that held off the Chaos Space Marines for several hours before aid came from the totally unanticipated quarter. It appeared that the traitors were repelled, though by a force that the Imperium had no record of. As the traitors closed the hastily constructed barricades of the Ormtel listening station, survivors reported that the night was filled with a mournful howl which sounded from all directions. As the Black Legionnaires faltered in their attack and cast glance in all directions, the rearmosts were dragged into the shadows. Soon the Chaos Space Marines were firing their bolters on full automatic and emptying entire magazines into the gloom as more were set upon by an enemy that the Kazarkin defenders could not see. In only minutes, the Black Legionnaires were all dead. Their bodies were found savagely ripped open as if by hugely powerful jaws, or racked by savage claws. The only evidence of this mysterious force that attacked them was the distorted Vox recording of the howls that filled the complex in the moments before the Chaos Space Marines attacked. It would later be determined by the Imperial Scholars that these mysterious saviors were none other than the long lost Space Wolf's 13th Great Company, lost for 10 millennia within the warp since the closing days of the Horus Heresy. During the outset of Abaddon's 13th Black Crusade, Cadia was alive with the diligent preparation of the servants of the Emperor. Regiments of Cadia shock troopers were being mustered alongside the Adeptus Mechanicus Titan Legions and Skitari. Regiments of the mighty Pharaoh Warriors stood alongside the brightly colored troops of the Mordian Iron Guard. Amongst this mighty throng, faith swelled strong and the morale of every man soared as they saw the amassed power of the Emperor, but a vile serpent lay ready to strike. The regiments of the Volscani Cataphrasks had landed on Cadia to join the army at Khazar Tyrock. The troops and officers of the Volscani regiments feared to face the forces of chaos again, and even if they had not formally pledged their allegiance to the Dark Gods, they had decided that it was better to die in clean battle against men in service to a dark cause than to stand at the gates to the warp and close ranks in the face of the power of hell once more. As the defenders of the Cadian Gate prepared for conflict, the traitorous Volscani revealed their new allegiance to the ruinous power, when they unexpectedly struck in force at the Imperial Guard troops being mustered at the Tyrock fields. The traitor slaughtered thousands of loyal guardsmen before any response could be coordinated. The intent of the Volscani treason was revealed as they swarmed aboard the Leviathan, which served as the commanding vehicle of the Governor Primus, Marius Porska of Cadia. The traitors proceeded to slaughter him and much of the senior command of the Cadian armed forces. This included the commander-in-chief of the defenders of the Cadian Gate who were killed in the brutal attack. At the darkest moments, then Colonel Ursicar E. Creed took control of the dire situation, rallying the 8th Cadian Shock Troop Regiment, 
the bloodied Imperial defenders were quickly organized and ordered to advance upon the traitors. The 8th Cadian led the charge into the ranks of the Volscani, Creed and Jaron Kell, his regimental standard bearer and most trusted friend, led the way during the counterattack, and it was they who reached the command deck first and succeeded in preventing the foul desecration of the fallen body of the governor Primus. The governor had fallen as a Cadian should, with a blade in his hand and a heretic at his feet. Creed carried the body of the governor back to the battlements of the Leviathan, wrapped in the banner of the 8th Cadian. Many more Cadian regiments came upon the scene, and the great throng of them gathered around. Colonel Creed, being a pious man, allowed them to sing their praise to the god emperor, and then from his lofty position he delivered his first speech to the armies of Cadia, to strive without rest until every disciple of Chaos had suffered the same fate as the Volscani. The host demanded that Creed should take command. Three times he refused the offer, but ultimately he accepted to the will of the massed Cadian regiments, as ever greatness thrusted itself upon Creed, and he could but strain to bear its weight. Through Creed's actions, what might have been a grievous defeat for the Imperium, and a victory for the hordes of the arch enemy, was turned into a defining moment for the defenders of Cadia. Every man and woman of the fortress world swore to repurpose themselves to defend the Emperor's realm. Following the betrayal on Cadia, pleas for aid from Imperial forces beyond the Cadian sector had been dispatched to military commands in the surrounding sectors. Warriors from the chapters of the Astartes Prazes and from the Space Wolves were expected to reinforce the beleaguered Imperial forces. The Astartes Prazes are a group of 20 loyalist Space Marine chapters whose sole purpose is to guard the Eye of Terror in the Segmentum Obscuras. The ancient tome, known as the Mythos Angelica Mortis, makes a single reference to the 20 Space Marine chapters created from the unique gene seed of those Primarchs who did not fall to chaos during the Horus Heresy, and who were charged with protecting the Imperial Sector surrounding the Eye of Terror, and supporting Cadia and the Inquisition as needed. The Astartes Prazes were eventually founded anew rather than assembled from the remnants of the Space Marine Legions, like many other second founding chapters, to reduce the possibility of corruption by veteran Space Marines who had been exposed to chaos during the fight of the Horus Heresy. Although the Brotherhood of Space Marines included in the Astartes Prazes originally included 20 chapters, one has been destroyed by the forces of chaos, and two other chapters, the Relictors and the Sons of Malice, were both declared excommunicate traitorous by the High Lords of Terra. The list of known Astarte Prazes chapters are as follows Angels Eradicant, Black Consuls, Brothers Penitent, Crimson Scythes, Ex Coriators, Iron Talons, Knights Unyielding, Marine Exemplar. Night Watch, Reclaimers, Subjugators, Viper Legion, and the White Consuls. Naval assets had been promised from Cyprus Mundi, and regimental muster had began in many nearby sectors. The full might of the Imperium was gathering, but only time would tell whether or not it would arrive in time. That a major chaos incursion was imminent was now beyond doubt, but the arch enemy would find the Imperium ready if only the preparation could be completed in time. Creed promoted those Imperial Guard officers he felt were worthy and ruthlessly demoted or transferred those officers he deemed incompetent. Though many resented his harsh treatment, and he had undoubtedly made many enemies, amongst the established Cadian officer class, many believed that his approach was a necessary one, considering the monumental task at hand. Though Cadian morale had been dealt a terrible blow by the betrayal, Creed had rallied the Imperial Guard and Planetary Defense Force charged with the defense of Cadia and the Cadian Gates magnificently. Though many senior officers had seen men who had fought a hundred battles over their careers waver, a single word from Creed could galvanize them into action. The man was imbued with fierce resolution and those under him could not help but be infected by it. 
The work of organizing the forces of Cadia continued at a rapid pace. As was standard practice, each world contributed regiments and organized its forces into battle groups. The Sector High Command assigned Departmental Minotaurum support services to each as they became available. With the starting establishment of six to nine Imperial Guard regiments per battle group, and at least six such battle groups formed into an army, Cadia Sector High Command had been able to assign a minimum of 10 army groups to the defense of every notable world in the region, with the capital world assigned as many as 100. Experiences showed that these battle groups would soon break down once they were required to redeploy to meet combat need as conflicts developed, and staff officers on the ground would need to organize their forces as best they were able. Such was the reality of staff work, when one was required to coordinate highly diverse units over such vast distances. As part of their constant vigil around the Eye of Terror, highly trained units of Cadian Kazurkin often pushed into the outer reaches of the swirling maelstrom, desperate to find some indication of where the first blow would land. Astropathic divination pointed towards the blighted world of Earthwart, a world already taken by chaos, its population enslaved and sacrificed to the Dark Gods. Finding nothing alive on Earthwart, merely death and hideous plague zombies infected with the curse of unbelief, the Karaskin prepared to withdraw. Suddenly, a frantic Vox communication from the Cadian's warships in orbit reported numerous vessels advancing on the planet from the Eye of Terror. The Karaskin attempted to fall back to their dropships to return to their troop carriers, but it was already too late. The Imperial ships in orbit were either crippled or were forced to disengage and make best speed for Cadia. There was to be no escape for the Karaskin who were stranded on Earthwark as the massive vessel, larger than the most gargantuan capital ship of the Imperium, approached the Doom World. This was the Planet Killer. Few were aware of the existence of this monstrous ship, for it had been thought lost at the battles during the Gothic War centuries earlier. And those were 40 facts about the Black Crusade, the 13th Black Crusade, sorry. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, we're finally getting started with the 13th Black Crusade. The Planet Killer has arrived. And if you remember from the Gothic War, the Planet Killer is basically a gigantic ship that is just going to fuck everything up. Uh, so please subscribe to the channel to find out what uh, Abaddon does with this Planet Killer um, before he fails. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys so much for liking, commenting, and sharing the previous video. You guys doing that really helps out. And if you guys want to help out a little bit more, please jump on over to Patreon. A simple dollar a month gives you uh, four extra videos. And we're going to start putting out Tactica um, and some uh, building or terrain building, base building, and um, army building list videos on there. So please support us there. I'll catch you guys in the next video. This was Gersh1 with One Mind Syndicate, signing out.